Hello students, Mr. Courtney here. In this video, we're, I'm talking about types of solutions and electrolytes. Our objectives will be to identify the type of solution based on the amount of dissolved solute and then identify substances as electrolytes, non-electrolytes, strong electrolytes, weak electrolytes. Remember, water is a polar substance, substance because oxygen is more electronegative than hydrogen. So the electrons that are shared are not shared evenly. So these shared electrons here are not shared. They are not shared evenly. Oxygen has a stronger pull on these electrons. So the shared electrons lie closer to oxygen. So that's going to give oxygen a slight negative charge and hydrogen a slight positive charge. Uh, what, because water is polar, it will dissolve substances that are like it. So polar covalent compounds and ionic compounds will dissolve in water. And when they dissolve, we know they break apart into their smallest units. That's called dissolution. And they seem to disappear because they break apart into, so, this, into particles that are so small, we cannot see them with our naked eye. So that's why they seem to disappear. When we put sodium chloride, in water so ionic compounds are going to break apart into ions sodium chloride is an example of an ionic compound when it breaks apart it breaks apart into the sodium ions and our chloride ions we can see the salt as we put it into the water but once it's dissolved it seems to have disappeared and it seems to have disappeared because our sodium ions and our chloride ions are so small that we cannot see them with the naked eye no what amount of that sodium chloride can be dissolved in water or in the solution? Depending on the amount of the solute dissolved in the solution, we have a different name for that type of solution. So is it saturated, unsaturated, or supersaturated? So we'll start up by talking about unsaturated solution. Now an unsaturated solution contains less solute that it can that it can normally hold at that given temperature meaning that if you add more solute you can still dissolve more so it has less than it can normally hold so if your gas tank is not full think about it as being unsaturated technically something like that so if we look at this here at 20 degrees celsius at room we call this room temperature we can dissolve, we have 36 grams of sodium chloride dissolved in 100 milliliters of water. But if we have 30 grams, if we added 30 grams of sodium chloride, we still have room for six more grams. So that solution would be unsaturated, meaning that we can still add more solute at that given temperature. A saturated solution, meaning that it is, when the solvent has dissolved all the solid it can at a given temperature. So it holds as much as it can hold. So you've filled your gas tank. You cannot add more gas into the tank. So here we cannot add more solute into the solvent. So it's filled. So we look at that same example. We can dissolve 36 grams of sodium chloride in 100 milliliters of water at 20 degrees Celsius. If we add 40, we will have that 36 grams dissolved and we have an excess additional of 4 grams that's going to remain on, on dissolved. So think about it now. You've seen this before. You have sweet tea. It's cold. You try to add more sugar to it and you keep adding sugar and you keep adding sugar to make it sweet. And all you're seeing is that the sugar is accumulating at the bottom because that solution is saturated. No matter what you you add, if you keep stirring, you will not be able to dissolve more because at that particular temperature, it cannot hold more solute. So it is saturated. It is filled.
So we're given 100 grams of potassium nitrate dissolved in 100 grams of water at 65 degrees Celsius. And when you're asked to determine is the solution sat saturated, super saturated or unsaturated? So we have to use our graph, solubility curve. Now we're not concerned with 100 grams of water because that's our standard. That's how many grams of water we're dissolving the substance in. So we start at our 65 degrees Celsius. We go to 100, so we get to this point. Now since we want potassium nitrate, notice this is the potassium nitrate curve, but this is where we stop. We can add more, we need to add more solute to get to that curve. So that means the solution is unsaturated because we still can add more solute to get to that point. So this is unsaturated. We have 169 grams of potassium nitrate now at 80 degrees Celsius. So we start at 80 and we go to 169. Let's say approximately 170. And here we see that solution is saturated because it is just about on that line because it contains the maximum amount it can hold at that given temperature. So if we look here, 80 grams of potassium bromide will dissolve in 100 grams at 80 degrees Celsius. Here we see since the point is below our potassium bromide curve, so if the point reaches below our curve, then it's gonna be unsaturated. We can still add more the solute the solvent can still hold more solute at that given temperature. So here we have 115 grams of potassium bromide at 95 degrees Celsius. Now this point takes us above the curve. So if this takes us above the curve, then that tells us the solution is super saturated because it, has mo it would have more dissolved in it than it can normally hold at that temperature. So it is super saturated. All right. So let's go on to talk about electricity and electrolyte. Now, electro electricity is the flow of electrons. So when we think about the atom, think about the small particles that make up the atom. We know we have protons, neutrons, and electrons. So the movement of these particles, these negatively charged particles, is what causes electricity. So electricity is described as the flow of electrons. Conductivity is a measure of the ability of a substance to allow electricity to, to flow through it. How well does it allow electrons, these negatively charged particles, to flow through it? And that is what we talk about in conductivity. That is what describes the conductivity, or better yet, the electrical conductivity of a substance. The relative conductivity of a substance is measured using what is called a conductivity tester. So we take our conductivity test and place it in a solution of a substance. If the bulb lights, then we say it's a conductor. If it does not light, we say it's a non. Now, water does not conduct electricity very well. Okay, so we have water dissolved. <laughs> Sorry, not water dissolved. If we put the conductivity test in water, we notice that the bulb does not light. So that tells us water or pure water does not conduct electricity very well. And by the end of this, you'll be able to tell why water does not conduct electricity very well. So remember, when ionic compounds dissolve in water, they break apart in their, uh, into their ions, or they dissolute. When they form ions, these ions have negatively charged species. Once you increase the amount of ions in the substance, then these ions are now able to conduct electricity. Ionic compounds that conduct electricity when they're dissolved in water are known as electrolytes. So when we add these substances, so when we add, let's say, like table salt to the water, then the bulb is going to light because it contains ions, these dissolved particles, these, these particles that have charge on them that allow the flow of electricity or the flow of these ions. So if we have a substance that is considered a non-electrolyte, that means it does not dissociate and the solution is not a conductor of electricity. So as we see here, no ions, it's a non-electrolyte solution. All these are compounds. So all we have are compounds, no ions. So it's not going to light, the bulb does not light. It's a non-electrolyte. 
A strong electrolyte is one that dissociates completely into ions when in solution. So all these species are broken apart into ions. So we have only positively and neg negatively charged species. We do not have a combination of positive and negative, which would be neutral. There are not any compounds of these. So the aqueous solution is going to be a good conductor of electricity. So we tested the bulb is going to light brightly. We have many ions. Right? And if it contains many ions, a large number of ions, the bulb will light. Then we have what we call weak electrolyte. It does not dissociate or they dissociate only to a certain extent. This is what we call the slightly soluble substances or slightly soluble ionic compounds. We have, they create few ions. Notice we have two positively charged particles, two negatively charged particles, and we have one, two, three, four compounds still. So it does not dissociate completely. So that means it's going to conduct electricity, but it's going to be a poor conductor. And it's able to conduct electricity because of the presence of these ions that we have here. But since we have so few of them, it's not going to be a good conductor. So it's a poor electrical conductor. So why is electricity dangerous around water? Knowing what we know, we've just talked about, about these dissolved substances that conduct electricity. Think about tap water and all these water from the lakes and all those things, they're going to contain minerals. These minerals, when they're dissolved, they're soluble in water. So they break apart into their ions. So that makes them electrolytes. And these electrolytes are able to conduct electricity. And if you look at the, here on the composition of the Dead Sea, ion concentration, look at the amount of dissolved particles we have. We have lots of dissolved particles in it. So that means it's going to be a good conductor of electricity. For a substance to be an electrolyte, it must meet two conditions or two criteria. It has to be ionic, and that ionic substance also has, has to be soluble. So if it's ionic but insoluble, it's not an electrolyte. It must be ionic and soluble to be considered an electrolyte. So for example, lead iodide is insoluble. It's an ionic compound, but it's insoluble, so it is not. The ionic substances must be dissolved in order to conduct electricity. And why must they be dissolved? When they're dissolved, they're going to be in their ion, ionic form. They're going to be broken apart into their ions, which gives us a positively and negatively charged species that we need to conduct electricity or they can be molten so we see molten sodium chloride okay so when they're molten they're also going to have ions because we've separated their ions here so if you put solid sodium hydrogen carbonate or baking soda test it with our conductivity tester as we did here the bulb will not light but if we add water to it to dissolve the sodium hydrogen carbonate then we see it the bulb lights that tells us it must be dissolved it must be in aqueous form for it to be I mean like for it to be conducting electricity so the solid ionic compounds even though they're 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 soluble and ionic will not conduct electricity so how do we determine if a substance is an electrolyte is the substance ionic or equivalent if it is not if it is not ionic, that means it's covalent, it's a non-electrolyte. If it is ionic, then we look at the next step. Is the substance or is the compound soluble or insoluble? If it's insoluble, it's a non-electrolyte. If it's soluble, it is an electrolyte. So it must be ionic and soluble to be an electrolyte, as we stated already. So is copper 2 sulfate an electrolyte? So we look at copper 2 sulfate, we look at the solubility of these substances and determine if they're. So we look at copper, copper 2 sulfate. So is it ionic or covalent? Copper sulfate is ionic. Good. Is the ionic compound soluble? Copper sulfate is soluble. 
and how we know we know it's soluble we look at our solubility rules okay so most sulfates are soluble except if they're paired with strontium barium mercury or silver so that means copper is not one of the exceptions so it's going to be soluble so that makes it an electrolyte sucrose so is it ionic or covalent? Since it's made up of carbon, hydrogen, and oxygen, which are all non-metals, that makes it covalent. So since it's covalent, we don't need to determine if it's soluble. It's a non-electrolyte, so it's not gonna conduct electricity. Calcium carbonate, we know it's ionic because it has a metal and non-metal, so we know it's ionic. Then we look at our solubility rules, so we need to determine if it's soluble or insoluble. Most carbonates are insoluble unless they're paired with ammonium or alkali metals. Calcium is not an alkali metal. It's an alkaline earth metal. So that makes it insoluble. And if it's insoluble, it's a non-electrolyte. So does water conduct electricity very well? We had this question already and said no. But why doesn't it conduct electricity very well? So remember, for a substance to be an electrolyte, it has to be ionic and soluble. Water does not conduct electricity because it's a covalent compound. It's made up of hydrogen and oxygen, which are non-metal. So it does not conduct electricity very well. Okay, this takes us to the end of this, this section. On to the next time. I'm out. Blessings.